Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I do agree. Okay, ah. welcome to this talk. No. Uh, I am the pointer. Ah. Okay. Right, so welcome to this talk. This is uh, no? no, I need the pointer. I cannot start. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so now the third attempt. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome to this talk by uh, Lisa, who is finishing her second year of the PhD. Mm -hmm. um, and she's going to talk about work that she's doing with, uh, with uh, Lucas, Victor, and me, and an external collaborator who's mentioned here on maximum Lyapunov exponents for temporal networks. Thank you. So, uh, as I said, um, I would like to talk about this project that I've been doing in collaboration with. Lucas, Victor, Tobias, and Leonardo Di Gaetano, and the title is Maximum Lyapunov Exponent for Temporal Network. Well, I would like to start from the very basics of a notion of temporal network. So where is a temporal, action, uh, a temporal network for us? Well, it's a network whose edge change over time. So they can be rewired, they can be introduced, they can be deleted, as we can see from this small movie here of a small network. Well, Many complex systems can be modeled uh, that evolves over time can be modeled as temporal network. And some of them show chaotic behavior. Like, like for example, the murmuration of birds in the sky or the brain that when affected by psychosis uh, seems to show chaotic dynamics. So the main goal of this talk is to introduce a procedure that is able to detect chaotic behavior in temporal network where those temporal networks are the product of a graph dynamical system that we may not know a priori. But before to jump directly into the realm of network, I would like to introduce uh, a bit of chaos. So what one of the main property of a chaotic system is the sensitive dependence on initial condition. This means that when two trajectories start very close one from each other, if the system is chaotic, their distance will increase exponentially over time. Uh, we can see here from the second figure. But a quantity that is able to detect this characteristic in a system is the maximum Lyapunov exponent of the system. So let's imagine that we have a map, a discrete map here, and we generate from this map a sequence of scalar value. So we start from the point x0 and we create a trajectory. And then we create another trajectory that starts very close by to this point x0, let's say at a distance d0. And if the system is chaotic, this distance will increase exponentially with a local expansion rate, L, that is a value that still fluctuates because it depends on the initial condition. So to have a value that is fixed, we send the uh, initial distance d0 zero to 0 and then the time t to infinite. So in this way, we obtain a maximum Lyapunov exponent of the system. That is uh, the rate of maximum expansion of the system, of the distance in the system. However, in real-time series, we cannot um, do this limit d zero that goes to zero. This is because we don't know the uh, dynamics underlying the system. So we cannot create a trajectory that starts arbitrarily close to our initial point. And moreover, in some system, we cannot neither do the time, the limit that t that goes to infinite because uh, the phase space um, is bounded, the attractor is bounded. So we, uh, when the time increases, the distance starts to be affected by this limitation. So we need an algorithm that can give an estimation of uh, the maximum Lyapunov exponent of the system in real time series. So we will introduce the Wolf and Kanz algorithm that are able to give an estimation of the maximum Lyapunov exponent. And then we will apply this algorithm to our temporal networks. 
So let's start with the Wolf algorithm. Okay. So imagine that we have our time series here generated by a dynamical system that we do not know. And we start from a point of the series, let's say Xi. Then from this, then we analyze the whole trajectory in order to find the closest point to this Xi. And we track their distance, D0, as it evolves over time. So we obtain in this way a, a local expansion rate but we um, notice that we can track the distance just up to a time tau, that is the saturation time, because after this time, the distance starts to be affected by the limits of the uh, attractor. So this is still a local, but um, how do I? Okay, this is still a, a local um, variable, so it depends on the initial condition. And in order to obtain an estimation of the maximum Lyapunov exponent, we average over the initial condition. And this is the maximum Lyapunov exponent estimation of the Wolf algorithm. However, Wolf has a limitation that is, it, track, it tracks just the, the evolution of the distance between two points. So to overcome this limitation, we can uh, introduce the Kant's algorithm that tracks the evolution of the distance um, of a ball of point. Indeed, if we start again from our initial point xi and we explore the trajectory, we can find the points that fall in a ball of radius epsilon around this xi. And then we compute the average distance of these points with the central point xi. And then we track the evolution of the average distance. In this way, we obtain a local expansion rate, but of the ball of points, not just between two points. So again, this is a local variable because it depends on the central value of the, of the ball. So we need to average over this initial condition. In this way, we obtain the Kant's estimation of the maximum Lyapunov exponent. So we have introduced our two algorithms and to sum up between the two algorithms so we don't get lost at the very beginning. Um, both track the evolution of a distance, but the Wolf algorithm track the evolution just between, of a distance just between two points. Whether the Kant's algorithm track the evolution of an average distance between a point and its neighbors. Both give an estimation of the max, maximum Lyapunov exponent of the system that will be different for, by nature, but hopefully very close to the original maximum Lyapunov exponent of the system. And about the um, advantages of the two algorithms, well, the Wolf algorithm requests to fix less parameter because we don't have, for example, to fix the saturation time um, and we don't neither need the, the radius of the ball epsilon. However, the Kant's algorithm gives smaller statistical fluctuation because um, it, it, it is defined with two levels of average, one over the neighbors of a point and the other over the initial condition. So we have our two algorithms that we are ready to apply to our temporal networks. But how we can do that? Well, let's imagine that we have our graph dynamical system that produces a time series of network. So where the element of our sequence here, our network that move in a graph base. So at this point, we have a time series of network to which we can apply our algorithm. But of course, we have talked just about distance up to now. So we need to define a distance between the network. In this work, we will consider the distance between network as the distance between their adjacent symmetric. Yes. Is the also the set of vertices? Uh, no, the number of vertices is fixed. Not, not only the number, but the label of the network. Yes, yeah, see, they are a uh, lovely network. Um, so in this case, we define the distance as the difference between their adjacent metrics, normalized by a factor that will depend on the type of network. Um, but the distance can be any measure uh, for a network. It depends just on the property you would like to analyze for the network itself. So just a brief reminder that in this talk, we will just consider a simple graph. So no 
uh, direction or weight for the edge, uh, no self loops and no multi hedge. Okay. So we have our algorithm. Um, we have our sequence of network, and we can apply the the we can test the algorithm towards our sequence of network. But before to jump directly to chaotic networks, uh, we need to have a ground truth for what is not chaos. So for what is a random sequence of network. Just one second. <clears throat> Then we create our random sequence of network by um, selecting the network as a random uh, Erdos Rainy random graph with n nodes and a probability p for an edge to exist between any two nodes. And in this way, uh, we have a sequence of network that is uncorrelated, that are uncorrelated. And given that the network are uncorrelated, we can also uh, predict the distribution of the distance between any two uh, network in the sequence. This will be binomial, as we can see here from the figure where we plot the experiment that are the, uh, the steps and the continuous line that is the tier. So thanks to this prediction, we can also have a prediction of the distribution of the local expansion rate for the Wolf algorithm. So, this is the local expansion rate for the Wolf algorithm, and we see that it depends on the distance. That is a random variable. So also the local expansion rate will be a, a random variable. And we'll have a Gaussian distribution with a, a mean value equal to zero, and with a variance that depends on the saturation time. So the mean value here represents also the um, Wolf estimation of the net network's maximum Lyapunov exponent. As we can see here in the plot, this is the, the steps, uh, the black steps are the, uh, the Wolf algorithm and the continuous line is the theory for the distribution of the local expansion rates. And the um, red steps are the Kant's algorithm. And we see that Kant's is more picked around this mean value. And this is because the Kant's algorithm requires uh, another level of average that is the, the one uh, between neighbors of a point. So we have now a ground truth for a random sequence. The maximum Lyapunov exponent should be zero. So we can go to chaotic series. And we will do that for two different types of chaos that are that is low dimensional chaos and high dimensional chaos. Well, we can start with the low dimensional chaos. And the question is now, how do we create a chaotic series? Well, we do that thanks to the dictionary trick. We create a, a dictionary made of graph, these are graph, um, with the distance between any two graph in the dictionary that is equal to the absolute value of the difference of their position in the dictionary. How do we generate the, the dictionary? Well, we create an elder Schreni random graph with n nodes and m fixed edge. And this is will uh, be this will be our first element of the dictionary here, and then we generate another graph that has a distance one from the cave element of the dictionary, just by rewiring a link that has not been moved before to a place that has never been occupied. And in this way, we generate our uh, J uh, G K plus one element, uh, our G K plus one graph that is the K plus one element of the dictionary. So given that the dictionary uh, preserved the matrix, we can say that this dictionary is basically a partition of the unit interval. And we can associate any dictionary, any uh, element of the dictionary to a subset of the unit interval. In this way, we can map any one dimensional time series into a sequence of network. Well, how do we do the mapping? Let's consider, for example, the logistic map. Okay, so we have our first value x0. If this um, x0 fall in the subset represented by the graph gk, gk will be our first element of the sequence. Then we let the map evolve. We obtain our value x1. Um, and this fall in the subset represented by gj. So gj will be the second element of the sequence of graph and so on and so forth till we obtain our sequence of graph. 
At this point, we are ready to apply the algorithm to the sequence of graph. And we do that for the case of the fully chaotic logistic map. That is when R is equal to four. In this, uh, in this case, we have a prediction of the maximum Lyapunov exponent of the system, that is logarithm of two. And we see for the Wolf and Kant's algorithm applied to our sequence of graph that the predicted values is very close to the theoretical one. And moreover, as the number of initial condition uh, increases, we, we reach very fast a value that is very close to the theoretical one, that is the dashed line. For example, in the Wolf algorithm, we reached this um, a very good approximation just at 100 uh, initial condition, whether for the Kant's it's even faster, and we reached a very good approximation around 50 initial condition. So to conclude this part, uh, we have seen that the, our sequence of uh, network reproduce the same dynamic of the logistic map. But, well, this is expected because uh, what we are doing with the dictionary tricks is just a, a partition of the unit interval, so a discretization in, in space of the logistic map. However, in real uh, time series, uh, there is often the effect of noise. So we also need to test uh, our algorithm against the presence of noise. How do we do that? Well, we have our logistic map, we generate a sequence from it, and then we contaminate them with the um, noise that is Gaussianly distributed, we mean zero and standard deviation sigma. So in this way, we obtain a contaminated sequence of values. And at this point, we can make the mapping to a sequence of network, okay? So to this sequence of network, we apply our algorithm the Kant's algorithm. And what we see is that the mean distance of the ball of Kant's that evolves over time increases exponentially with the same maximum Lyapunov exponent um, of the original system without noise. So the effect on noise, even if it increases, is not to change the maximum Lyapunov exponent, but to shrink the region, the scaling region for the distance. Indeed, what happened here is that the, uh, the noise introduced a um, lower threshold for the typical time of, uh, for the typical distance of the system. And indeed, when the noise is very high, uh, is 0 0.1, the scale introduced by the noise is the same as the attractor. So we cannot track any scaling anymore. So we are ready to arrive to the last part of this talk, that is I-dimensional chaos. But to do that, I need to introduce the concept of globally coupled map. Well, globally coupled map are uh, map that are interacting uh, among themselves in a mean field coupling, where the coupling is controlled by this parameter alpha here that represents the strength of the coupling. Um, in this work, we will consider globally coupled logistic map. That is when this function here as the, is the logistic map and also globally coupled tent map. That is when this function is the tent map. But let's focus a bit on the coupling strength alpha. So this, value can, this uh, parameter can uh, vary between zero and one. When it is zero, we have um, a system that is composed by M independent map. So um, basically there is no coupling. When it is one, the, uh, the map, the globally coupled map is fully coupled. So each variable is affected by the holder as it is affected, affected by themselves. But the interesting thing is what happens between these two extreme values. Indeed, as the coupling increases, the system show a different behavior. Like for example, in the case of small coupling, we see a turbulent state that is basically high dimensional chaos. In the intermediate value of the coupling strength, we see an ordered or also we see a glassy phase. But uh, in the case of high coupling, that is when alpha is um, greater than 0 0.5, um, the state of the system is fully synchronized. That is basically each variable 
at that time t as the same value as the other. And this system and this state here is stable in this limit. But we are, of course, interested in the first um, case that is the small coupling because we have here high dimensional chaos. So, how do we build the network, the temporal network in this case? Each variable is associated to a link in the network. So, if the variable at time t is um, lower than 0 0.5, then at this time, the hedge in the network doesn't exist. And on the contrary, if it's uh, equal or higher, the, net, the edge at this time does exist in the network. So in this way, as time goes by, we have a, a temporal network. We obtain a temporal network to which we can apply our algorithm. However, to see a scaling region here, we need uh, a very high dimension of the system. But the problem if the dimension of the system is very high is that it is very difficult to find a recurrence. That is, it's very difficult to find a close, um, close point to our initial condition. So given that in this case, we know the dynamics of the system, we can overcome this problem by generating a sequence of graphs that start from a graph G0 and then perturb this graph in order to obtain another uh, trajectory that starts very close by to this one. And then we can join these two sequence in a bigger sequence that, that show indeed recurrence. Um, we can repeat this procedure many times in order to have uh, many recurrence in the larger uh, sequence. So now we obtain our sequence of graph that show recurrence and we can apply um, the Kant's algorithm to this, to this sequence. So what we see is that the mean distance uh, of the ball of cans increase and increase exponentially. So the systems show in this a chaotic behavior. behavior. Moreover, when the um, uh, coupling strength increase, the maximum Lyapunov exponent of the network decreases. Um, this is because the system is going towards a more ordered phase. That is the intermediate limit for the coupling strength. Um, we have tested this, um, this algorithm for two cases, for the logistic map, as we said at the beginning, and also for the tenth map. For the tenth map, we have a theory behind, and the continuous line, the black continuous line here is the theory for globally coupled logistic map. Whether the square are the case of our sequence of network, and we see that they are very close, so our sequence of network uh, reproduce the dynamic of the globally coupled map behind. So to conclude, in this work, we have introduced a procedure that is able to quantify sensitive dependence on initial condition in a temporal network. And we have tested, we have tested this procedure against the artificially created chaotic temporal network. These are models that are very interesting and they definitely need the further analysis in the future. But definitely the next step will be to try to apply this procedure to real-time network in order to uh, see if they show chaotic behavior. So, so I would like to thank my collaborator and also Luis for giving very useful advice on the, on the topic and on the talk and you for your attention. Thank you very much. So this is open for discussion, questions, comments. Hi, uh, cool talk, but I got a little bit, bit lost when you explained the mapping between the um, um, iteration map and a, net, a network. Like uh, between the logistic map? Yeah, for example, okay. like you have an array of values that are real numbers. Mm -hmm. And then how, how do you create those networks that are very complicated? Thing that has a lot of information on it, so I didn't get that much. Yeah. Okay. This this one here. Yep. Okay, so maybe before from the dictionary. 
So the dictionary, what it does is that um, it's basically a partition of the unity interval. So the map, uh, for the for example, the sorry, I cannot see uh, the map. For example, the logistic map um, is a map that is limited in, in the interval zero and one. Um, so when you generate a trajectory, it will have value that is between zero and one. Um, and the, our dictionary is just a partition of the uh, unit interval. So each graph is uh, associated with a sub interval of the unit interval. And the nice thing is that it preserves the, the metric of the unit interval. So the distance between the, the two graphs that um, are inside that different sub interval is, is equal to the distance between this sub interval. Okay, so when you generate the trajectory with the logistic map, you have a value, for example, 0 0.1, and you have uh, um, a network associated 0 0.111 um, that is for, for example, in the, okay, 0 and 1. The dictionary discretizes the, the unit interval, you can see there. Okay. Uh, so, for example, you have, um, well, I don't know how many they are, but this is 0 0.1, and your value of the generated with the logistic map fall in this interval because it's between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. But to this interval, there is a network associated. So, when this value evolves over time, it falls in different position of the unit interval. And then it, it will be a different network. Okay. Okay. So yeah. this is the sequence of that. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned that you want to to apply this to real networks. Do you which kind of networks are you thinking of? And then the, then immediately the, the question is, uh, this uh, Lyapunov experiment may, is useful if the to characterize chaos, I, but the, I don't. In principle, the the dynamics can be the distance between the networks can grow in many other ways, which are not exponential, can be power laws or many other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I mean, there are other ways to to monitor. I mean, just monitoring the distance between networks is good enough. If it's exponential, okay. But if it's not exponential, is I mean the Lyapunov exponent is just one way to characterize one particular behavior. The important thing is the is the behavior of the of the trajectory. Of the trajectory. I, I would say. But anyway, which experiment, which real networks are you thinking of? Uh, we were thinking about two two type of network. One is the um, the birds, as we said at the beginning. So we define the network as a proximity network between the birds, and. Um, uh, we would like to analyze how this evolve over time. So if the birds get together, and then at some point it will, um, they will separate. Maybe they they will return to a point we, in which they are very close to each other. So we maybe will have our currents, but they will separate in a different way. Um, this is an example. Or another example is the um, it's always the proximity network of. Um, of ch child in school um, because maybe they um, during the breakfast uh, breakfast uh, do, during the break they uh, they will all join together in the um, in the country yard and then they they separate in different classes as the there is lesson. So these are the um, network that we talk we talk about, but uh, we definitely need more exploration in the in the literature because yeah. Co further comments? Yes, maybe. Um, so, for instance, we discussed with Romualdo Pastor Satoras in in the CCS conference. He has. Um, he can do experiments with with small crowds with small um, swarms and he can gps track them so an idea yeah. is to is to build proximity networks of 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 crowds with with gps tracks and and see what what goes out of it also they they i think they could do experiments with fish 
yeah. I remember a talk at thesis last year that they were showing this kind of yeah so he has he doesn't have a pool but but he yeah. has some some small, small uh, tanks yeah Thank you for the talk. I, I recognize I get lost very early. So um, so the first thing I don't understand when you say that you map some variable to a graph, hmm. what is this graph? Where it come from? How do you construct it? Uh, the second is, okay, you started your motivation by saying that, that you have a set of graph and then you compute something. But in my understanding is that you have created graph from time series. So if you get one particular sequence of, of graphs from the real world, what do you do? Yeah, the, this will be definitely the next step. That is, um, here we have test our algorithm uh, with sequence of graph that we know that will be chaotic because we created that way. Uh, but when you deal with a real time uh, networks, we don't know if it will be, um, well, it will uh, have any metrics, for example. Um, and also uh, it may show different behavior, I guess, that is maybe uh, at some point is chaotic, but at another point the, the time network is not chaotic. But about, um, about this, I mean, I tried with real time network and well, with, with just an example, just to play around. Uh, and it's definitely more difficult. Okay. But uh, I think that if we are able to um, analyze well what we are doing, that is, this is a good thing of this, uh, this procedure of the algorithm, that we can really see the distance, how it increases, and we can. Uh, decide where the increasing is exponential or not. The problem will be to understand if it's in a graph, uh, if it has a metric. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really a graph dynamical system that generates the, the temporal networks. Yeah, well, I think it could be more useful if you try to find something from the temporal uh network that give you a number and and this number can be representing some kind of dynamics or not uh than to fix one particular type of dynamics and try to see whether this type of dynamic occurs because maybe you you have bad luck and never find it maybe you find one maybe mm -hmm. it's not general i don't know so may maybe you can try to expand the idea to figure out with some time, uh, with some temporal network, how do you calculate something that can give you the information more than fixing the type of dynamics that you are trying to, to figure out? Um, I have a question. I don't know if maybe a little bit related what, what uh, Strada said. Um, it's about, uh, okay, when you uh, you compute the Laponoff exponent with your algorithms, you start for two very close initial conditions, no? And then you see how they uh, hmm. separate. If you have um, a real data uh, from experiments, you cannot initiate the experiment with two very close initial conditions. H how are you going to that, do with that? Well, the, the algorithm works that you have a sequence of that where you have a time series and then in this time series you find a close point it's not that you generate another trajectory um is this the question yeah okay sure no no be, time. <laughs> be, uh, it, it was just to understand your question no no, no my question was that that okay. i don't know if you can you cannot start if you just oh, no. find another point that is close to them and see if the how it repeat okay that, that's uh i mean you don't you cannot create a trajectory that start close by but if in the trajectory you have a point that start close by uh you are well first of all very lucky because <laughs> um but then they will evolve as they as they were created very close together no 
because it's the same dynamical system that generates them. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just have one question about, like you said, you would do um, these, or you would apply these models to uh, the movements of birds. How do you get the data for the birds? Like, do you have, how do you track the single birds in a in a well, swarm? Well, do you just have high resolving cameras or? Uh, yeah, the, the, it does exist like so. uh, the, the, this kind of um, uh, system uh, that, tracks, that tracks the bird with the camera. And for example, a group in Rome was able to make this kind of system that, and well, the problem is that uh, when two birds uh, cross one each other, uh, they get the, they, they lost the information of what was the birds or not. And they were able to overcome this problem. I don't know how, uh, what are the technicality of this, but yes, you can track the movements of the birds and stay with the same birds all the way. Uh, and like, how long are these time series that you get then? Like, because probably the swarm then moves away at some point or do you, do you follow it? Yeah, I, I mean, well, just uh, personal experience. Um, they can last very, very long. Like they can they can be out for an hour, some, some of that. I have my personal video of these things in Rome that were, were like 20 minutes of this murmuration around, yeah. Anybody else? Or I don't know. Any comments or no? Okay, thanks then. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, okay, in, in this case, you have labels, uh, notes, no? Yeah. But in the case of the birds, it's going to be also, you also need that. Uh, you have to change your metrics to have difference between labels and networks in the case of birds uh yeah. i mean it's, it's important which bird is which bird yeah or you can assume that all the birds are going to behave the same way you know well yes it, i think it will be lovely as well <clears throat> that's a very good question um yeah. i think there are like two answers uh, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. If you only follow this this kind of recipe, I mean, this recipe is done for the simplest case where graphs are labeled. So essentially, a graph is a matrix, right? And in that case, we would need bird A to be a bird A along the way. So, and there are ways to. I mean, people in Rome, as she said, um, they they. They have a way to know which bird is which bird throughout the, the the trajectory. Now, your question also opens up a very interesting question, I think, and it, and we comment. It's like a follow up, which is how to extend this when the graphs are not not labeled, because in that case, graphs are much more different than just a matrix. It's 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 it's, it's a whole new thing. Mm -hmm. So. In the events where we don't know who is whom, but we only know about the the interaction between nodes, uh, how can we measure sensitivity to initial conditions in that case? Well, that, that's a matter of definition, well, right? Well, it's, I mean, it's a graph that evolves over time. So you, the vertex set could evolve, the edge set could evolve. You can have graphs. I mean, for instance, you know very well this. I mean, in the group of graph dynamics, you can have, you know, the line graph when it iterates itself, yeah. right? Well, they are dynamical systems on graphs, you name it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So indeed, I mean, that's true. I probably, mm, you know, most of the people that have been working on these things, because the way they, they measure stuff uh, require uh, notes to be labeled, then it's been labeled all, all along. But, but still, I think 
in many cases, it's worth investigating, you know, graphs that don't have labels because this is much, much more general. And it's it's more challenging, but but it's I think it's doable and, and it's yeah. I, I would consider this as a follow up. Yeah, but I guess the, 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 the question is, what's the graph dynamical system behind? If it's in terms of, of not one uh, at time t plus one is a function of some other things, then in, this is intrinsically labeled. If it's something else, you can imagine a more general updating rule, like the graph itself at time t plus one is something based on the graph itself at time t. And in that case, it's not it's not a matrix dynamical system. It's it's some it's a something else. It's a graph dynamics, you know. And in and in that case, there are no labels, and you don't need labels to to define the the dynamics of the whole graph and. Uh, at least for our question here about quantifying sensitivity to initial conditions, the whole thing boils down to how can we measure the distance between two graphs that are not labeled. If that is solved, and there are ways to solve this, of course, then the whole thing can, can be applied. Thank you. Yeah. I want to ask also about the variables. No, that there are uh, definitions are important. Uh, if you don't define what you are talking about, nobody can understand what you are talking about. So why labels are important in temporal networks is because you try to track what is the sequence of information, not only in space, but in time. So this was the main motivation. So you have for one snapshot of a temporal network, you have a spreading of information in space. So between the nodes, but now you want to track what is the spreading of this information also in time? So there are temporal path apart from tempo, from uh, a spatial path. So for instance, in the case of the birth, and uh, so there are, there are fantastic algorithms that people in engineering use, which are flocking algorithms. And uh, they are basically uh, not considering labels because what they are, they are studying is just the, just the dynamics. It has a very important uh, practical applications uh, uh, for that. So this, these are variations of what they call the consensus protocol and the red and white protocols. And they use more than one variable. So you have two or three variables because you need not only the position of the nodes, but you have the uh, needed of the speed, uh, angles, et cetera. And, and then this is a different matter. So graph dynamics is a completely different matter because you don't care about what is happening in the path and there is no time at all. So you put a graph to evolve, the line graph evolution is one of them, et cetera. So I, I, I mean, uh, uh, we, can, we can extend the, the concept to uh, other ideas, but then you have to take care about how do you track, if you don't have labels, how do you track the temporal transmission of information uh, in this temporal network, which is one of the important things there. Yeah, I must say, I, well, okay, I, I, I don't like the word temporal anyway. I would call, just call it time dependent, right? Time dependent networks. Well, side tapping. Side -tapping. Okay, man, okay, man. But, I, but I wanted to ask you your earlier comment, right? To expand the concept of, so the way I see this is like when people started looking at time series, I don't know, in the 80s, and they wanted to say, I have a given time series, is this chaotic or not, right? And then you have to come up with some methods. And that is what Kant and, and Wolf and others did, right? And you, as you say, you cannot repeat and you cannot repeat the experiment. You only have one time series. So, but when they did it, presumably the first thing when they had the algorithm is like, okay, let's test this on the logistic map, right? Where I know what the level of exponent is. So I generate a time series artificially, synthetically and feed it into the algorithm and see if I get the right level of exponent. I mean, I'm sure that's what they did, right? 
and this is pretty, I mean, that's the status of this, I would say, right? More or less, okay, in a nutshell. So, but I'm not quite sure what expanding the concept or you said something about not focusing on one type of dynamics earlier, like 10 minutes ago or something. Like, I don't know what exactly. Okay, oh, wow. okay, so there are the measures. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I almost guarantee <laughs> that almost no one real temporal network is caught. So under your definition. Uh, no, no one, no, no temporal network is out, is out even. No, oh, because uh, uh, this this um, uh, dependence of initial conditions. So uh, typically, suppose I, I have worked with temporal network from the real world from telephone companies when I was in the UK, and uh, and then you have uh, uh, snapshots at the per minute of telephone uh, calls between millions of people, and of course, if you try to track this path of information spreading. It will depends always of who is the one who started the the the, the phone call. So, what is the meaning of uh, 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 sensitivity to initial conditions? The second step will already depends of who started the first step. So I don't I don't see the point. I can comment to that. You Ernest Ernesto Estrada of all people that like theory. Don't see the point. I mean, the, this is um, the the point is 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 that it is totally true that temporal networks have a are ne a necessary framework to understand real world some complex systems, uh, and in in that sense, most of the metrics that have been defined are based on the necessity to understand re real real world problems right such as the ones you commented with telephone networks etc at the same time um when a theoretician looks at temporal networks they see graphs that evolve over time and therefore at least in my opinion a sensible question is well if you have dynamics so time evolution and you have graphs why don't we make a theory of dynamical systems on graphs? So let's let's leave it there then. <laughs> Right. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, and thank you, Lisa, again for the talk. <laughs>